a lot of people have been very critical of the recently released Google's Gemini 1.5 for essentially, in my words, I could say super woke, woke in the uh, negative connotation of that word. Uh, there is some almost hilariously absurd things that it does, like it modifies history, uh, like generating images of a um, black George Washington, or um, perhaps more seriously, something that you commented on Twitter, which is refusing to comment on or generate images of, uh, or even descriptions of uh, Tiananmen Square or the, uh, the the tank man one of the most sort of legendary protest images in history. And of course, these images are highly censored by the Chinese government. And therefore, everybody started asking questions of what is the process of uh, designing these LLMs? What is, what, is, what is the role of censorship in these, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you uh, commented on Twitter saying that open source is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, so um, can you explain? I I actually made that comment on just about every social network I can, and I've, <laughs> I've I, I have uh, I've made that point multiple times in in various uh, forums. Um, uh, here's my my point of view on this: uh, people can complain that AI systems are biased, and they generally are biased by the distribution of the training data that they've been trained on. Um, that reflects biases in society. Um, and that is potentially offensive to some people or potentially not. And and some techniques to de-bias then become offensive to some people um, because of you know historical uh, incorrectness and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can ask the question, you can ask two questions. The first question is, is it possible to produce an AI system that is not biased? And the answer is absolutely not. And it's not because of technological uh, challenges, although there are uh, technological challenges to that. It's because bias is in the eye of the beholder. Um, different people may have different ideas about what constitutes bias. Um, you know, for a lot of uh, a lot of things. I mean, there are facts that are you know indisputable, but there are a lot of opinions or, or things that can be expressed in different ways. Uh, and so, you cannot have an unbiased system. That's just an impossibility. Um, and so, what's the what's the answer to this? And the the answer is the same answer that we found in liberal democracy about the press. The press needs to be free and uh, diverse. We have free speech for a good reason. is because uh, we don't want all of our information to be uh, to come from a unique source, because um, that's opposite to the whole idea of democracy and uh, you know progress of ideas and even science. Right? In in science, people have to argue for <laughs> different opinions and. And science makes progress when people disagree and they come up with an answer and, you know, a consensus forms, right? And it's true in all democracies around the world. So there is a, a future which is already happening where every single one of our interaction with the digital world will be mediated by AI, AI systems, AI assistants, right? We're going to have smart glasses. You can already buy them from Meta, <laughs> the Ray-Ban Meta, where um, you know you can talk to them, and they are connected with an LLM, and you can get answers on any question you have. Or you can be looking at a monument, and there is a camera in the in the system that in in the glasses you can ask it like, can, "What can you tell me about this uh, building or this monument?" You can be looking at a menu in a foreign language and this thing will translate it for you or you can, we can do real-time translation if we speak different languages. So a lot of our interactions with the digital world are going to be mediated by those systems in the near future. Um, you know, increasingly the search engines that we're going to use are not going to be search engines. They're going to be uh, dialogue systems mm -hmm. that we just ask a question. And it will answer and then point you to perhaps an appropriate reference for it. 
But here is the thing. We cannot afford those systems to come from a handful of companies on the West Coast of the U.S. Because those systems will constitute the repository of all human knowledge. And we cannot have that be controlled by a small number of people, right? It has to be diverse. For the same reason, the press has to be diverse. So how do we get a diverse set of AI assistants? Um, it's very expensive and difficult to train a base model, right? A based LLM at the moment, you know, in the future it might be something different, but at the moment that's an LLM. Uh, so only a few companies can do this properly. And if some of those top systems are open source, anybody can use them, anybody can fine tune them. Um, if we put in place some systems that allows any group of people, whether they are uh, individual citizens, groups of citizens, government organizations, NGOs, uh, companies, whatever, to take those open source uh, systems, AI systems, and fine tune them for their own purpose on their own data, then we're going to have a very large diversity of uh, different AI systems that are specialized for all of those things, right? So I tell you, I talk to the French government quite a bit, and the French government will not accept that the digital diet of all their citizens be controlled by three companies on the West Coast of the US. That's just not acceptable. It's a danger to democracy, regardless of how well-intentioned those companies are, right? Um, and so, uh, and it's also a danger to local culture, to values, to language, right? I was talking with uh, uh, the uh, founder of Infosys in India. Um, he's funding a project to fine tune Lama 2, the open source model produced by, by Meta, so that Lama 2 speaks all 22 official languages in India. It's very important for people in India, I was talking to a former colleague of mine, Mustafa Sisse, who used to be a scientist at FAIR, and then moved back to Africa, created a research lab for Google in Africa, and now is as a new startup called Kera. And what he's trying to do is basically have LLM that speaks the local languages in Senegal so that people can have access to uh, medical information because they don't have access to doctors. It's a very small number of doctors per, per capita in, the, in Senegal. Um, I mean, you can't have any of this unless you have open source platforms. So with open source platforms, you can have AI systems that are not only diverse in terms of political opinions or things of that type, but in terms of uh, uh, language, culture, value systems, political opinions, um, technical abilities in various domains. And you can have an industry, an ecosystem of companies that fine-tune those open source systems for vertical applications in industry, right? You, you have, I don't know, a publisher has thousands of books and they want to build a system that allows a customer to just, just ask a question about any, about the content of any of their books. You need to train on their proprietary data, right? Um, you have a company, we have one within Meta, it's called MetaMate, and it's basically an LLM that can answer any question about internal uh, stuff about, about the company. Uh, very useful. A lot of companies want this, right? A lot of companies want this not just for their employees, but also for their customers, to take care of their customers. So the only way you're going to have an AI industry, the only way you're going to have AI systems that are not uniquely biased is if you have open source platforms on top of which uh, any group can uh, build specialized systems. So the the direction of, of inevitable direction of history is that the vast majority of AI systems will be built on top of open source platforms. So that's a beautiful vision. So meaning like a company like Meta or Google or so on should take only minimal fine tuning steps after the building the foundation pre-trained model, as few steps as possible. Basically. 